you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. We'll pick up where we left off last Sunday morning, verse 7. We're looking at Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And uh, last Sunday we talked about unity. And within those first 16 verses of the fourth chapter, there are three major themes of unity, diversity, and maturity. And so this morning we're going to take the second of those themes and talk about diversity and the gifts that God gives. We'll do that in just a moment, but as always, before we talk about the Son, let's bow our heads and hearts and let's talk to His Father first. Father, we come before you excited and with joy in our hearts, the goodness that comes as a feeling from serving, from doing what we've been called to do, to look at Scripture and say, uh, Matthew 25 says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. So when we're obedient to Scripture, it feels good weeks like this. And I thank you for the most successful vacation Bible school I've ever seen or been a part of. I thank you for the praise and worship that was offered up by those children all week long. How blessed and how special you had to feel. And I thank you that we are training a new generation to put you first in their hearts and their minds and their lives. To worship you. To adore you. And I thank you that we were able to do that this week. I thank you for the folks that are going to be fed, those that are going to be clothed. And I just pray that this whets our appetite for what's ahead, that we will do more and more service and being obedient to the commands of Scripture because it feels so good when we do. We thank you for the Apostle Paul and for this bold, encouraging letter. And as we open up its pages this morning, Father, we ask you to come in a powerful way. We pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins, for they are many. We come to this place this morning to see Jesus of Nazareth and him only. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. If you'll turn with me to the fourth chapter, we'll start there with the seventh verse where we left off last Sunday morning. We'll go down through the thirteenth verse. Where the Apostle Paul writes as follows. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lowest earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, we left off last week studying verses 1 through 6 and talking about the subject of unity. Unity in the church. Unity in the body of Christ. Unity for revival. And we noted that in order for revival to take place in a church, that unity must first precede that revival. And we went on to know five things that Paul gives us in verses 2 and 3 that are prerequisites for unity. Things that have to be present in the individual members of the body of Christ in order for it to be unified. The first one we saw was humility. The second, gentleness. The third, patience. The fourth, forbearing. Putting up with one another in love. And the fifth, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Those five things must precede unity, and unity must precede revival. And if you remember, when we began chapter 4 last week, we moved into a new part of the book of Ephesians. The beginning of chapter 4 marks a turning point in Paul's letter, and a turning point in our study of that letter. The first three chapters of Ephesians are doctrinal chapters, chapters of theory and theology and biblical teaching for the church. And the last three chapters of Ephesians are the practical application of that biblical teaching. Let me say it again because it's important. The first three chapters of Ephesians are doctrinal chapters, chapters of theory and theology and biblical teaching for the church. And the last three chapters of Ephesians are the practical application of that biblical teaching. And so for our study of the last three chapters of Ephesians, we deduced an important principle last week, and it was as follows. All of the doctrine in the world won't mean a thing if you don't take that doctrine and make it operative in your life. Let me say it again. All of the doctrine in the world won't mean deadly squat 
if you don't take that doctrine and make it operative in your life. I had a deacon one time in another church that I served who could go through the motions better than anybody that I know. But I believe that he and I and God were the only three that knew the truth about him. Folks, he taught a Sunday school class. He served on the board. He prayed public prayers. He served at the communion table. He participated in discussions, made major decisions for the church. He appeared to do it all. And then I caught him doing something that you don't do in the world, let alone in the church. And when I confronted him about it, tears streamed down his face and he said to me, Bill, it has never been real to me. I've been going through the motions all of my life. I believe it all up here, but it never made its way to my heart. The principle, all of the doctrine in the world won't mean a thing if you don't take that doctrine and make it operative in your life. So from here on out, you can't just sit and take notes. It's time to get up and get out and apply it and make it real in your life. Do something about what you've learned. Let me ask you a question. Do you live like you believe? Say it again because it's important and I want you to think about it. Do you live like you believe? In other words, has it made its way from here down to here? John Morley, who was not a Christian, once said, If I believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and my Savior, I would never write or talk of anything else. The principle, all the doctrine in the world won't mean a thing if you don't take that doctrine and make it operative in your life. All right, enough said, but from this point on, it's important to remember that principle. Now, in the first 16 verses of chapter 4, there are three major themes that appear. The theme of unity in verses 1 through 6, the theme of diversity in 7 through 13, and the theme of maturity in verses 13 through 16. And after covering unity last week in verses 1 through 6, diversity is the second theme that emerges in 7 through 13. Paul says to be unified, you don't have to be exactly alike. You're not to be Christian clones of one another. In fact, just the opposite. To be truly unified, each diverse individual member of the body is to be unique, different, and special, so that the body may be complete. To be completely unified, each diverse individual member of the body is to be unique, different, and special, so that the body may be complete. How do we accomplish that? By realizing and using the spiritual gifts that God has given to each and every one of us. To every single believer in Christ. Most of you know that I take my shoes off when I teach the Word of God. I've been doing that for 24 years. However, last Sunday was the first Sunday I preached without shoes since the Sunday before Easter back in April. The reason I do that is because of Exodus 3, 5, when Moses stood before the burning bush and God said, Moses, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. I had an encounter similar to that with God the third year of my ministry. And I've been taking them off when I teach his word ever since. Aaron and I were at Aldi's this week. We were loading up the truck with uh, groceries to bring back here to the church. I walked up front to the front seat to put some stuff in there. And a man walked over to Aaron, who was back at the tailgate, and he said, Who is that man? I know him from somewhere. And Aaron said, Well, oh, he's Bill Lockman. He's a pastor down at Seymour Christian Church. He said, That's where I know him from. I've been to that church before. When I came back around, he introduced himself. And he said, I just didn't recognize you with your shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I have had them on for the past couple of months is because the doctor wouldn't let me take them off. I'm battling that plantar fasciitis, which is a real pain in the foot. <laughs> if you've ever had it, you know. Four years ago when I had it, I had to get the custom-made orthotics that cost an arm and a leg, you see those? They mold your feet, and then they send you back these orthotics to put into your shoes. It cost an arm and a leg to get two good feet. <laughs> but they were fine since then. I wore them religiously, and then the week before Easter, it came back, and it's been slow going away. I do stretching exercises every waking hour of the day. I ice my feet at night before I go to bed. It's amazing how one little part being non-functional makes my whole body incomplete and out of whack. 
Last Sunday afternoon, Love was in here, and she was decorating the church, getting ready for vacation Bible school. And she sat down there in the foyer, and she was putting some signs on the wall with arrows pointing crafts this way. And when she got up, she forgot about the defibrillator box that was right above her head. And she stood up, and wham, she hit into that box, put a big lump on her head, and just really staggered her. And when she hit, she kind of twisted sideways with her legs. It, it hit so hard, and she tore the cartilage in her knee. All week she's been in tremendous pain. You wouldn't know it from the way she's been around here, up on stage, dancing with the kids and hopping and jumping around. But she paid for it at night. It's amazing how one little part being non-functional makes the whole body incomplete and out of whack. Now take that and apply it to the church. You may think that coming and sitting and rising and leaving is enough. But if your little part, your little gift is non-functional, it makes the whole body incomplete and out of whack. Did you know that only 5% of spiritual gifts are what we call visible gifts, sight gifts? 95% are what we call invisible gifts. Let me say it again. 5% of spiritual gifts are visible gifts. 95% are invisible. The visible gifts are the ones that you see, the teaching, the preaching, the leadership, out front, the people you see. The invisible gifts are everything else. The service gifts, the encouragement, the cooking, the generosity, prayer warriors, the behind-the-scenes kind of gifts that we've seen go on all over this building all week long. First of all, you need to understand that every believer has been given a gift from God. And the Bible says, whether you choose to use it or not, that every believer has been given the gift of encouragement. We have all got the ability to become somebody else's cheerleader. Now, some use it and some don't. But it's given to every single believer. Some have the Eeyore syndrome. They choose to discourage instead of encourage. You know Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? Oh, bother. Thanks for noticing me. I'll probably never do anything for God, and neither will you. We got those in the church, don't we? But that's not the reason God gives the gifts. They're given so that the body of Christ would be built up, encouraged, that it might be complete. And it won't be complete if you don't realize and utilize your gift. Let me give you a principle that will help you understand the nature of spiritual gifts. Here it comes. Gifts are to the spirit as personality is to the flesh. Say it again. Gifts are to the spirit as personality is to the flesh. In other words, your flesh, what we see and hear and touch, has a personality that makes it unique and distinctive. And your spirit, what we can't see and touch, has God-given gifts that make it unique and distinctive. Your personality allows you to fit into society, allowing society to become complete. And your gifts allow you to serve and build up the body of Christ, allowing the body to become complete. And if only one of you is not using your gift, it's like my foot or love's knee that is non-functional, thus making a miserable time for the rest of the body. I wish everybody could have been here this week during vacation Bible school. It was incredible. Things went so great, so smooth. Everybody had a wonderful time. Why? Because everybody chipped in and worked and served. Everybody brought food and clothing and fellowship, and the body was built up. And we were more complete this past week than we've been in a long, long time, maybe ever. Two weeks from tonight, we're going to have a ministry fair. Ministry Connect. It's a ministry expo. We're going to ask you to come back at 5 o'clock into this room, and there are going to be 21 ministries set up in this church that you can volunteer to be a part of. Everything from mowing the grass to setting up chairs and taking down chairs. 21 different ministries. And we're going to ask you to come back and sign up for at least one. Get connected. Get involved. Get some ownership in this church that you come to. That's our goal, to be unified, yet diverse and unique. Because we all bring different gifts to God's table. I mean, what if we had 500 toes in here this morning? First of all, it would probably smell pretty bad. Or 500 fingers, or what's even worse, what if we had 500 mouths in here? But 500 different parts of one body make up a pretty complete unified body. And that's why and when we operate most efficiently. Okay, with an understanding of gifts, that everyone has them, that they're used to build up and complete the body of Christ. Let's look at four things from this text 
that Paul gives us about the diversity of the gifts and their purpose for eternity. Number one, Paul would have us note the reason for the gifts to which God has given us, each of us, the gifts of his grace to be used for the whole church, verses 7 and 8. Of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. Paul's quoting Psalm 68, verse 18. A lot of things happened when you became a Christian. You were forgiven of your sins. You were made free for the first time. You got rid of your guilt. You were given an address in eternity. You're going to last forever. You were turned loose on the world. You're free to risk. And your life was given meaning. But let me tell you something else. When you became a Christian, God gave you a gift. And it's a supernatural gift. It's a gift to be used in the church for the good of the church. Or not to be used for the church and it will hurt the church. And there are no exceptions to that. As you can see, we're surrounded by food and clothing out in the semi. Some of you have the gift of generosity. You're really good givers. God has gifted you with the financial resources to do that. But this food is here this morning because everybody gave. Everybody did what they could. It wasn't one person giving 21 and a half tons. It was everybody doing their part to make up what you see. Between the first century and the day, we've lost this teaching. Today, everybody thinks when we hire a pastor, the pastor is supposed to have all the gifts. The pastor is supposed to be a top flight administrator, have his PhD in counseling, be a tremendous leader, understand the Bible and theology. He's supposed to be a comforter and healer and prayer warrior and spiritual warfare specialist and a public relations expert. And ladies and gentlemen, there is no pastor on the face of the earth who possesses all those gifts. And I'll tell you what a pastor does. He either fakes it and his church gets by, or he doesn't fake it and he's honest with these people in the congregation. And he tells them the truth. He tells them they're the ones with the gifts. And he gets them realizing and utilizing their gifts in the body. And then the church really takes off. All of you have been called to do things in this church. And if you don't, the church is going to suffer. And I'm not going to do it for you if it's your calling. Some of you have been called to teach in this church, to teach our children. And if you don't, the church is going to suffer. And I want you to know we had the most incredible teachers we've ever had in Vacation Bible School. I was so proud of them. Our kids were blessed and shown favor by God to be in those classes with those teachers. Some of you have the gift of evangelism, sharing your faith. Some to be involved in the world. You're, you're a light in a dark place. Some have the gifts of service. One more thing. There are no degrees of gifts in the church. 1 Corinthians 12 makes that clear. A lot of times we think that if someone has a visible gift of teaching or preaching or leading, then their gift, of course, is more important and they're more spiritual because they're out front where everybody can see them. That's simply not true. The Bible says plainly there are no degree of gifts. If I hadn't showed up this morning, we would have had preaching or teaching. Somebody would have filled in. But what if people hadn't showed up to put the chairs up? We'd be sitting on the floor. What if Kyle and Jason back there hadn't showed up this morning? There'd be no music or sound or video. What about the nursery workers, Rhonda and her people? There'd be no nursery. Mark Noble, who fixes your coffee and goes to the store and buys your donuts and sets this place up on Sunday morning. What if the praise team didn't show up? There'd be no singing. And I can go on and on and on. The point is, there are no unimportant gifts in the church. They're all important. Can you imagine our Wednesday nights and all the wonderful fellowship that we have without the meal? That meal is really doing it like the first century church did it in Acts 2. Gathering together for the breaking of bread. That's the one time a week where we rub elbows. That's where we visit and we talk and we eat, break bread together. Those who couldn't serve food on Wednesday nights, they hold our Wednesday night fellowship together. Let me tell you something. When we enter into a building program, we're going to realize the tremendous importance of using our gifts in the body of Christ. I can't tell you how important individual gifts will be in completing a building program. That gift of generosity, the giving, the carpenters, the plumbers, the electricians, the welders, the drywall, the concrete, the painters, those who put down flooring. Everyone gets involved and uses their gifts and the church prospers. And if not, the church suffers. Beloved, the reason for the gifts is so that you might benefit the whole church body. There's a story about a Jewish village. And in a Jewish village... The synagogue is the center of life 
in a Jewish village. It's not just a place where they go to worship. It's a place they go to do everything. They go for community. They go for fellowship. They go for, for court, for judging, and just all kinds of stuff to meet the needs of people. And so the synagogue is very important. And the rabbi who was in charge of the synagogue this one year, he said to all the people in the village at harvest time, when you bring your grapes in and you make your wine, I want each of you to bring a stone jar in of wine. And he had this huge container there in the middle of the synagogue. And he said, I want you to pour it in the top. We'll pool our resources, get all of our wine together, and then for all of the feasts and celebrations that we have during the year, we'll have enough wine if everybody just does their part and brings a jar. And so after the harvest, when the wine was made, they all brought their jars in, they dumped it into that huge container, and when they had their first feast, their first celebration, he got down at the bottom, he turned the spigot, you know what came out? Clear water. Clear water. Everybody had the mindset, if I just give water and keep my precious wine, it won't cost me anything. I mean, after all, everybody else will be giving wine. It won't matter, just one jar of water. Unfortunately, they all had that mindset. Using your gifts in the body of Christ is extremely, extremely important. Secondly, I want you to see not only the reason for the gifts, Paul would have us know the giver of the gifts. To wit, Jesus Christ is the giver of the gifts, not your preacher, not any preacher, not your parents, not your college education, not your sophistication or your good looks, but Jesus Christ is the only giver of the gifts. Verse 8, when he, Jesus Christ, ascended on high, he, Jesus Christ, led captives in his, Jesus Christ's train, and he, Jesus Christ, gave gifts to men. Now, under this point, let me give you three quick comments. The first is this. The gifts which are given by God are given according to His sovereign will, nothing more, nothing less. Sometimes those gifts go along with your natural talent and ability, and sometimes they don't. God doesn't go around checking at what you're good at and then give you a gift accordingly. He doesn't check to see if you like your gift or have you fill out a gift survey, see your strong areas, and says, oh, here, here's your gift. His gifts are almost all the time given at random. No reason, just because. Because why? Because He's God. Why else would I be up here? I have no formal Bible training, no Bible college or seminary, no pastoral training of any kind. 27 years ago when I started this, I had never made a hospital call, done a wedding, a funeral, been to no school on prayer. If God didn't give it randomly, how in the world did I get it? But look, if God calls you for something, He's going to equip you to do what he calls you to do. He never asks you to get on a train that he doesn't give you a ticket first. A week ago, yesterday, we had Pete Green's going home service, his memorial service. And Pete was one of the charter members of this church. He was a good, good man. And I learned in doing research for that memorial service that he was a man of many talents and gifts. He was a carpenter. He could build anything. He was a woodworker. He was a stone and a brick mason. He was an artist. He was a man of many talents and gifts. He realized those and he used those. And God has given you gifts too in the body of Christ. You need to realize those. You need to start utilizing those. I've heard Christians say, oh, I can never do that. That's just not me. It's not my thing. Hello? If God gifts you, he equips you. If he calls you to do it, you do it. His gift will be sufficient. Then comment number two, gifts are often given in the midst of service. In other words, it's a lot easier to steer a moving car. Too many Christians sit around, pastor comes up and says, what are you doing? They say, oh, I'm just sitting here waiting for my gift. And God says, get moving. Then I'll show you your gift in the midst of service. You see, it's not your ability he's interested in. It's your availability. He will gift you accordingly if you're available. I spent a lot of time teaching little leaguers how to pitch baseball. We worked on their stance, we worked on their motion, their finger position on the ball, their body momentum, focusing on the target, loosening up their arm, releasing the ball, completing the motion, fielding after the pitch. We did all that before we ever went out on the mound. One year in Florida, I had a little boy by the name of Aaron. He had five brothers and he lost his dad to cancer the year before. After I taught them, we went out on the mound and he started throwing. And he started throwing strikes and he kept throwing strikes all season long. I had never in my life seen an eight-year-old with so much control and speed and accuracy. Every game he would go out and pitch his three innings. And he would throw strikes. 
all those three innings, striking kids out, and he would walk no one. I mean, he was a natural. He had a gift. He didn't know he had a gift until I pointed it out and trained him, but then he really began to utilize that gift. He became a great pitcher. People drive me crazy who say, well, nobody asked me to do anything. Folks, just come and serve. Get involved in what's going on, and God will gift you accordingly. He'll start using the gifts that you already have. Come and get off the starting line. Come and get started. God gives gifts in the midst of service. Don't sit around waiting for God to zap you with His gift. Get moving. Get obedient to Christian service. And then you watch what He does in the midst of that service. All right, comment number three. The Christian who's been given a gift of God will be frustrated and empty and miserable and less than God wants them to be if they are not using their gifts. I call it the Christian constipation syndrome. Always taking it in, but never giving anything out. Sitting and soaking, sitting and soaking, soaking it all up, but then never serving and giving anything out. I don't even have to illustrate that because I can see heads nodding in agreement. You know who causes problems in the church? It's not those who do everything and are out serving. They hardly ever complain. The people who cause problems in the church are the armchair quarterbacks who sit back and do nothing but criticize those who are doing something. Beloved, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. And if He wills it, you will be miserable until you use it and get on board. Thirdly, I want you to see not only the reason of the giver of the gifts, Paul would have us know the importance of the gifts. To wit, gifts are so important to the church that God has given gifted men and women as equippers of the body. Verse 11 and 12. It was He, Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastor teachers. And here it comes. To prepare God's people. To prepare God's people for works of service. Now this is where most congregations, and you guys being the refreshing exception, this is where most congregations say, I know what you're trying to do here, pastor. You're trying to get us to do your job for you. We always thought pastors were lazy and you just want us to do your job for you. Somebody said my pastor is incomprehensible on Sundays and invisible the rest of the week. But some congregations say, you're just trying to get out of doing your job. No, that's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to get you to do your job so that I can do mine. I'm trying to get you to do your job so that I can do mine. God called me to be a pastor teacher. He didn't call me to change the world. He told me to teach those who will change the world. It's not the coach who gets out on the field and plays the game. The coach's job is to equip you to go out and play the game. This is just, get this, this is just the huddle. This isn't the game. We have some awesome huddles here on Sunday morning. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. The game's to be played out there in the trenches against the enemy, against the devil. My job is to equip you and give you the tools to do your job. You know, if I'd have been God and I'd been looking all over the face of the earth for somebody to be a pastor and teacher, Bill Lockman would have been the last person in the world I would have chosen. But that's not the point, is it? God called me to be a teacher, to equip his people, to teach his church, not so that I could change the world, but that I might teach those who will change the world. I'm simply an equipper, a coach, a player coach, who teaches others how to win the game. And if I'm not so great, it doesn't matter. God put me here, and He put love here to equip you to make a difference in this world for Christ. It's your job. Fourthly and finally, very quickly, I want you to see not only the reason and the giver and the importance of the gift, but Paul would have us know the purpose of the gift. To wit, all of the gifts are used for the glorification of Christ, to build up the body of Christ, not the individual believer. Verse 12 to 13a. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. The pastor teachers, the evangelists, the apostles, the prophets are to equip the saints, i.e. you guys, you're the saints, to equip the saints for the work of ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. Any growing church's pastor will tell you we're growing because there are no superstars in our church, just servants, just servants who are out using their gifts to build up the church. Your gift may be watching the nursery, or preparing communion, or sitting up chairs, or taking chairs down, or handing out bulletins, or greeting visitors, or cooking in the kitchen, or mowing the grass, or giving, 
or inviting people to church or serving in silence so that nobody sees except God. You're going to hear a lot about using your gifts together here in unity in the future because that's going to be the whole direction of this church. Why? Because we accomplish so much and it feels so good when we do what we've been told in the Bible to do. Getting you equipped to change people's lives and make a difference in this world. Look at what we've seen already in just one week at Vacation Bible School. Let me finish with this. Love and I visited Southside Christian Church about a month ago. It's a church where we first started serving back in 1987. When we got there back in 1987, there were about 60 to 70 people in that congregation. Ordinary people. Ordinary nobodies. There are no superstars in that church. And as I sat there in the service that morning, in that beautiful building that I saw God build brick by brick and board by board with those 60 to 70 people, I was greatly convicted. And God said to me that morning, Bill, if I did all of this when you didn't have a clue what you were doing, what can I do now with six to 700 people and at least now, after 27 years, you've at least got a clue. I told you what's going on here that we were growing. How we were out of space, no more Sunday school space, Sunday school rooms. We were out of space, second service. And Ronnie Fair, one of the elders, said, you going to build another new one? And I thought to myself, are we? Are we willing? He said, Bill, I never saw anyone like you when you first came here. You'd grab people that were visiting with us for the first time. And you'd say, we don't need a committee. That hammer, that paintbrush, that shovel, that drill fits perfectly in your hand. And you'd grab them by the arm and say, come help us. And the crazy thing was, they did. <clears throat> Are we going to do it again, folks? Are we going to bring all of our talents and gifts together for the good of the body and be complete and accomplish what God wants us to do? We have to. It's our legacy to the next generation. We have to. And there's no greater joy in the world than God putting a goal out in front of you and coming together as a complete body and knocking off that goal. I guarantee you. That's great. Father, we thank you for a wonderful week where you've proved to us it's crazy the way that we get to a scripture going verse by verse and we get to a scripture on a Sunday after we've all come together and it talks about coming together and using our gifts. You use people all over this property this week doing different things, diverse things. And yet it accomplished one goal. So we praise you for that. We praise you for the illustrations of life that you give us. It was fun this week working together, rubbing elbows with brothers and sisters in Christ, getting stuff done, knocking off the to-do list, raising 21 and a half tons of food. But the main thing that we did this week was plant you in the hearts of those children. Because someday they'll be standing up here. They'll be leading praise teams. They'll be organizing vacation Bible schools. They'll be teaching children. And so we thank you for a successful week of passing along. We love you. And in a couple of weeks, you're going to give us the opportunity to get involved, to take ownership of this church. I pray there's not one person who won't sign up for one thing. Because the truth is, if you're too busy to sign up for one thing, you are way too busy. We love you, Father. We want to serve you, too. That's our prayer in Jesus' name.